So let's go ahead and uh, keep moving forward with this uh, meeting. Today we are going to talk about bonding and touching on how the day goes. We may start talking about new structures or we'll just talk about it on Wednesday. Either way. Um, there are several main like, big categories of bonding. The first one that we're going to talk about is ionic bonding. All right, ionic bonding occurs, as the name would imply, um, when we're dealing with ions, right? It occurs when you have an ionic compound. So if you remember back to the nomenclature unit, we talked about what an ionic compound is. We had a cation bound to an anion, all right? So there's a bond between those two things. And bonding in general, not just ionic bonding, but in general, bonding has to occur when atoms are close enough together to where some of their valence orbitals can overlap, so they can have electrons shared or jumping around. But if they're too close together, then they're going to be repulsed by all the electrons that they're seeing. Like, oh my gosh, there's so many electrons, and I have so many electrons, and I oh, can't even get away from each other. But if your atoms are too far apart, then you also won't have bonding because they're not close enough together to overlap any orbitals. So there's sort of a sweet spot when bonding happens and it differs between what atoms you have being bonded together. But roughly, bonding occurs when your atoms are about one angstrom apart. All right? When so what? One angstrom. The symbol for angstrom is a little zero over the top. That's an angstrom. So it's really small. All right? Roughly an angstrom apart, give or take. All right? And that's kind of that magic distance where they're close enough together to where you can have orbitals overlap, but they're not too close together to where they're going to be repulsed by all the electrons of each other. Okay? So an ionic bond is actually a very strong bond. It's one of the strongest bonds there is. So it's a strong bond, and it is defined or characterized as when electrons, specifically valence electrons, because remember those are the ones involved in bonding, not the core electrons, but the valence electrons. When electrons are given or taken by the different atoms, all right? Sometimes you'll see books described as electrons that are being accepted and donated, but it means the same thing. So electrons are given and taken. And when this happens, you're forming ions, okay? So let's just take a, an easy example. Let's take sodium chloride. So sodium, if we were to draw that Lewis structure, so that has one valence electron, right? And we know that chlorine has seven because it's a group seven atom. So what we're actually seeing when these bond is this valence electron is jumping over here to chlorine so that chlorine can have a full octet, right? We talked about that with the non-atomic ion configurations and everybody wanted to add electronic and yada yada. So what we're seeing is when that happens, we have sodium now being bonded to chlorine. And so we have the sodium cation and the chloride anion because those, that electron was given that made sodium be positive because it lost one electron. And it made chlorine become negative to become chlorized because it gained that one electron. All right, so we have a sodium chloride molecule. Um, you can also use this kind of Lewis structure, if you will, um, to help us understand some of the other nomenclature systems that we saw with ionic compounds. So remember when we had ionic compounds, we had to use subscript, the balance charge. So when we had um, magnesium and chlorine, for example, we know that chlorine is going to take one of those electrons. Right? But magnesium makes a plus two charge. It's going to lose the second electron. The only way it can do that is if somebody else, say, for example, another chlorine atom, took that other electron. And so now what we have is chlorine and magnesium. There's two chlorines each bound to a magnesium. So we have two ionic bonds, if you will. All right? And we're looking at this. That's why you had to have NGCl2. This two meant that you had two chlorine atoms bound to the magnesium. Each of those chlorine atoms took one of those valence electrons from magnesium to become chloride. So you have two chlorides. And so now we have that ionic 
right, so ionic, com ionic bonds occur when electrons are given and taken between the atoms. Given and taken. Contrast that with covalent bonds. Now, covalent bonds is a big, big category. There are a lot of compounds that have covalent bonds. And a lot of the um, bonding compounds that we talk about most of the time are going to be covalently bound um, compounds. So, for example, like in organic chemistry, almost everything is a covalent bond. All right, so that's that's a huge subset of, of compounds. Is organic chemistry. So. A covalent bond is a very general, very big topic. A lot of compounds fall underneath this. And the defining point about a covalent bond is that those valence electrons, okay, when the orbitals are overlapping, those valence electrons are being shared. All right, they're not given and taken. The electrons are being shared. Covalent bonds have quite a large range of strengths. Some are weaker than others. Some are surprisingly strong. Some covalent bonds are so strong that they're just maybe one step below an ionic compound, an ionic bond. So covalent bonds have a very wide range of bond strength. Um, but the, the defining characteristic is that those electrons are shared. Sometimes those electrons are going to be surrounding one atom. Sometimes they're going to be surrounding another atom. Within this big category of covalent bonds, we have two subcategories. Uh, we have polar covalent bonds, and we have nonpolar covalent bonds. Let's talk about nonpolar covalent bonds first. Nonpolar covalent bonds are defined as electrons that are being shared equally. So we have equal electron sharing. You can kind of think of it as a tug of war. So atom X and atom Y are being covalently bonded. All right, they're sharing some electrons between the two of them. And they're both pulling on those electrons that are in that bond. And when they are pulling equally, you say that you have a nonpolar covalent bond. So an example of this would be hydrogen, like diatomic hydrogen. When we're drawing the Lewis structure for, for hydrogen, we know that each hydrogen atom has one electron. We also know that hydrogen is kind of looking around saying, you know, I just need one more electron to put in my 1s orbital, and then I can have a mono, uh, isoelectronic configuration with helium. So he's looking at his electron saying, hey, um, can I borrow your electrons so then I can have two electrons in my orbital? And this hydrogen is saying, hey, can I borrow your electron? Then I can have two electrons in my orbital. They're both kind of saying, well, what are we going to do? We both want the other person's electrons. So what they decide to do is they say, all right, we're going to share both of these electrons. 50% of the time, the electrons are going to be around this hydrogen, and 50% of the time, they're going to be around that hydrogen. Okay, you can say that the electron density is the same around each of those atoms. All right? They're 50% of the time here, 50% of the time there. They will share those electrons equally. So in a tug of war, you're at a stalemate. Both sides are pulling the same. Nobody wins. All right? So they're compromised. They're sharing them equally. And therefore, you have a nonpolar bond. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. The opposite of a, of a nonpolar covalent bond is a polar covalent bond. Your electrons in that bond are still going to be shared. However, they're not going to be shared equally. This is called unequal electron sharing. They're going to be shared unequally. So somebody's going to hog them, all right? So instead of setting the timer, okay, you can play with the toy for five minutes, and then you can play with the toy for five minutes. Somebody's like, uh-uh, I'm going to play with the toy for 10 minutes. And then you can have the toy for two minutes. All right? So it's unequal sharing. When this happens, so again, let's look for X and Y scenario. When this happens, one of those two elements is pulling more on those electrons. 
And so, arbitrarily, I'm just going to choose Y. The electron density is going to be much greater around the one of those atoms than there is around the other one. That is not to say that poor X over here never gets to have the electrons around him. He will, but a much smaller percentage of the time, whereas Y is going to have it around him most of the time. Because of this unequal distribution of the electron charge, we find that you have a slight negative charge over here where the electrons are spending most of their time and a slight positive charge over here where they're spending just a little bit of time. This is called a dipole moment. We talked about this a little bit um, when we were talking about um, polarity and remember I was talking about detergents and soaps and washing your clothes and all that stuff. So we kind of talked a little bit about it already, but let's get into some more detail about it. A dipole moment is indicated on your molecule. You'll draw an arrow that points towards the more negative side, and then you put a line over it so that you can distinguish it from other arrows that we have in chemistry. But a, a low line over your arrow shows that this is a dipole moment, and it points in the direction of where the negative side is going to be, the delta minus, where that electron density is spending the most of the time. We call that having a dipole moment. So this would be a polar molecule. An example would be, um, let's take hydrochloric acid, HF. All right, chlorine has seven electrons in its valence shell. And as we know, because we've talked about um, the electron configuration for both of these, as we know, this chlorine molecule is looking, or this chlorine atom is looking at that valence electron on hydrogen saying, I want that electron. Give it to me. I want it. I want to have the full octet. Give me, give me, give me. And hydrogen is saying, okay, could I maybe borrow one of your electrons for a little bit so I can play with it for a little bit? And chlorine's like, I want it, I want it, I want it. So what we see happen is the vast majority of the time, chlorine hogs that electron. He pulls really hard on that tug of war. He really wants that electron. In a little bit of the time, hydrogen is going to have some electron density around him. He's going to have one more electron from chlorine over by him. Small percentage of the time. And so what we find is we have a delta plus over here because most of the time that electron is going over here causing this to be sort of positive. It's not really an ion because we haven't given that electron away. And over here, this is going to be slight negative because it's not really a fluoride. It's just most of the time got that extra electron around it. Every once in a while, hydrogen will get his way and he's gonna have both electrons, all right? So this is definitely a polar molecule. Hydrochloric acid is extremely polar. It's kind of an extreme example of polarity. It's, it is knocking on the door of being ionic. It's so polar, all right? But it's not. The covalent molecule, the covalent bond, is just a very polar covalent bond, all right? Now this is all well and good. All right, we kind of understand, all right, valence, electrons, okay, they want to have a full octet, wonderful. So if you look back to, um, what page is that on? Uh, page 357, remember when we talked about electronegativity last time? When we talked about the trend for electronegativity, it was on page 357. The electronegativity values for the individual atoms are going to tell you how polar your bond will be. Now, we're not going to calculate polarity in this class. Um, that's beyond our scope. But you could, if you wanted to, you could determine how polar a bond would be. Is it really, really, really polar? Or is it just a little bit polar? Or is it nonpolar? All right. It's just a difference in the electronegativity values for those two elements. All right. So when we look, for example, at hydrochloric acid, fluorine, because it's the most electronegative element, has an electronegativity value of 4.0. Hydrogen has a 2.1. The difference between 2.1 and 4.0 is pretty strong. All right, we have a very covalent, I mean, a very polar covalent bond. Um, so we can look at we can look at electronegativity values to determine polarity. As far as what I'm expecting for you to know in this class, I'm not going to have you memorize electronegativity values. No, I just want you to know the trend. Right? So you should be able to look at this hydrochloric acid and say, oh, well, I know fluorine is more electronegative than hydrogen, so that's definitely 
that's the extent of knowledge I would expect from you, okay? Questions about that so far? Okay, so when we're looking at two atom molecules, it's super easy. We can just look at the two atoms, determine which one is more polar, or which one is more or less negative, and oh, okay, that's polar. I'm sure you can imagine that as you get into larger molecules that have more and more and more atoms, you will obviously have more and more bonds in that molecule. The charming polarity can get pretty hairy, <laughs> okay? So taking it to the extreme, if you had a macromolecule like a protein or an enzyme, you're gonna have all kinds of dipole moments pointing in a million different ways, all right? And a lot of times we'll use computers and x-ray crystallography to determine is part of this molecule going to be polar? Is part of it not polar? Is there maybe like a polar pocket, you know, where your substrate can fit in there and bind? I mean, who knows? But it all is going to lead us up to a structure function relationship. So understanding this concept of polarity is really important because we're going to build on this. And as we build bigger molecules and look at the shapes, next week, next Monday, <laughs> I'm trying to remember the schedule. I think next Monday we're going to do the geometry stuff. As we start looking at the geometry, we're going to have to pull it up, pull out this, this knowledge of polarity and say, okay, this bigger molecule is polar or not polar. And all you have to do is look at the individual bonds, okay, and determine polarity based on that. We'll talk about that next week when we get there, but I'm just letting you know that's why we're looking at this, all right? At this point, I want you to know what a covalent bond is and the difference between a polar covalent and a non-polar covalent. Know what a dipole moment is, okay? Questions about that? Okay, the next type of bonding, this is super easy, is metallic bonding. Metallic bonds are very unique. Um, so far when we've been talking about bonds, we've been kind of looking at individual atoms and okay, this has got this valence electron and that valence electron, and this is going here, and this is going there, and they're sharing or whatnot. Metallic bonds are a little bit unique because those valence electrons around the atoms are kind of loosey-goose, all right? We oftentimes call them delocalized. Delocalized electrons. That's what it's called. Delocalized electrons. And what that means is those valence electrons are just kind of swimming around in between the atoms. Let me draw you a little picture. It's one of the few things I can draw. Enjoy. Because <laughs> when we start drawing molecules, it gets very ugly very quickly. Okay. So those are my atoms. We'll say this is like a piece of copper wire. All right, so there's some copper atoms, right? The valence electrons for these atoms are just kind of floating around willy-nilly in between these atoms. They're delocalized. It's not necessarily, okay, this electron goes with this atom, and this electron goes with that atom. They're just kind of free floating in between. Free floating and kind of looking at it like this, you can see why it is also called a sea of electrons. It's a sea of electrons that the atoms are kind of floating around in. Because of this characteristic, we see a lot of metallic properties starting to make a lot of sense. And if you look in your handy dandy um, little note sheets, there's a table here between, that talks about some properties between metals and non-metals. I don't expect you to memorize this, but we can look at some of these properties and say, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Having these three mobile electrons clearly makes sense as to why metals conduct electricity so well, as opposed to a non-metal where they don't have that. We can also see why um, uh, metals are very malleable. You can kind of bend them a little bit because as that metal is bending, as that copper wire is bending, these mobile electrons are kind of reorienting, reorienting themselves, They're kind of cushioning, if you will, those atoms before it breaks. Whereas non-metals characteristically tend to be very brittle in the solid form. They just shear very easily. Whereas metals, you can kind of bend them and move them, caress them a little bit because we have these delocalized of electrons, okay? Um, questions about that? So this like bonding thing is just very unique around 
I want to show a video about this because I think it'll, I think it does a good job helping me visualize what's happening. So I know we've all heard of the Bronze Age. And if we think about that was a long time ago, <laughs> it's really quite fascinating that even way back then, before we had things that enhanced technology, humans were able to come up with the idea, oh, hey, if we melt these two metals together, we make a new metal that has really interesting, strong properties. All right? And we're going to, in this video, they kind of show why we would why would we even want to do that? Why can't we just make a spear out of copper and you know kill the buffalo or whatever it is that we were trying to do back then? I don't even know. <laughs> Not a history major. All right, so that's really kind of an interesting point to kind of drive home. Was this was a long time ago? Or I don't know, saber tooth tiger? What the heck? I don't even know. <laughs> I don't know. Sumerians. <laughs> Damn Sumerians. <laughs> Ready to accept the molten bronze. And what we have here, David, is the bronze. 
put in the furnace. As you can see, they're, they've got a little bit of heft to them. Yeah. They average about 20 pounds. So that's a mixture, actually, of 80% copper and 20% tin. And what we have here is the tin in a raw form. And this is how it comes out of the ground. This is from Malaysia, okay? And we have a chunk of copper, the way it comes out of the ground, and that's from South Africa. So that's the recipe for bronze. Exactly. Copper plus tin equals bronze. Equals bronze. Yeah. Why couldn't you use one of those metals by itself? Why don't you make bells out of just copper? If it was all copper, it would first of all be too soft, and we wouldn't get that sound that we want from a bell. Tin with copper gives us that hardness. Adding tin to copper during melting changes the properties of the metal. The larger tin atoms restrict the movement of the copper atoms, making the material harder. A flow causes the atoms to vibrate, but the tin prevents them from moving too far out of position. Tin is good for a bell, but only in the right proportion. Okay. So that's kind of the, I, I love the little animation that they showed. When you had the copper by itself, when you had that copper by itself and they smacked it with the little, the copper would have been too soft and squishy and it would have just kind of dented it. So if you had a bell, it really wouldn't do much because you constantly just bang into it and it would make a dent. Whereas when you add those tin atoms in there, you have a different size and that helped give it a little bit more strength and made it, made it stronger. And so when that hammer hit that, that alloy, it would just vibrate back and forth, almost like a, um, like a wave. And if you heard the difference, and because they didn't emphasize the sound, which was kind of weird because the guy totally emphasized once what the sound was. But if you heard, if you listened closely after they rang the bell in, you heard that ringing, that ring, as opposed to just thunk. If you heard that ring, that was the sound that they were going for with bells. And if you, um, you know, hear bells ringing somewhere out and about, you know, that sound travels and it almost makes an echoey sound. Okay, it's because those molecules of the atoms in this case are moving back and forth and they're just kind of being pushed and vibrating back and forth in the sea of electrons. That's the only reason I wanted to show that video. That was kind of interesting. Um, for metallic bonds, all right, there are delocalized electrons. You have what's called the C of electrons. Okay. Also in your handouts. talking about putting atoms together to make molecules, okay? If you remember, we talked about the octet rule, how atoms are striving to get a full octet so they can be isoelectrons of a noble gas and their valence shells would be complete, all right? That's what that means, having a full octet, eight electrons in a valence shell. That's what we're going for. Before we can start building our molecules, though, we have to remember that there's always exceptions to every rule. And so I want to go over the exceptions to the octet rule. All right? Um, let's start with some of the obvious ones. Obviously, you can't always have eight. All right? So some elements will never have more than eight electrons around it. The most common or the easiest one to remember would be hydrogen. Hydrogen's never going to have a full octet, ever. When we're talking about the octet rule, um, we're really focused on covalent bonds. Right? Let me specify that, first of all. So we're looking at covalent bonds. Hydrogen's always going to have just two electrons in it. All right? That's the most it can do. So with this bonding, with the sharing of electrons, um, hydrogen would be an exception. Another common exception is beryllium. Hydrogen can make one single bond. Beryllium can only have four electrons around it, so it could have two single bonds. We'll talk about the bonds in a moment. Another exception to the octet rule would be boron. It can have six electrons. 
obviously two, four, and six are all less than eight. All right, so those are three common exceptions that I want you to know um, to this octet rule. So that when, once we start building our molecules, we have to keep these in mind and remember these exceptions. Um, kind of on the opposite side of that is the fact that you could have more than eight electrons around it. And you're thinking, well, how is that possible? Because the S sublevel holds two electrons maximum. The P sublevel holds a maximum of six electrons. You can't stick more electrons in these orbitals. Right, the Pauli exclusion principle says no more than two. So two plus six is eight. Where are you gonna stick the extra electrons? Breaking this octet rule by having more than eight electrons will only occur if you have some room in a D orbital. All right, so common exceptions to this. I mean, if you wanna get technical, it could be anything really after phosphorus because you could start to get some D orbitals, but it's phosphorus and sulfur. Bromine, iodine, I want to say xenon. And I know xenon's a noble gas, so it's it's actually only been alive in the last, I guess now maybe 25 years, but we've been able to make compounds with xenon, but before we couldn't, but now we can. But we see that it has the capability of breaking the octet rule. Um, but these are the ones that I would want you to know, the PSBRI. Um, and they can be fine. They all have more than eight. So for example, phosphorus could have one, two, three, four, five bonds around it, which would give it 10 electrons. So anything more than eight electrons would be an exception to the octet rule. So you can have less than eight, you can have more than eight, the only other exception that we would need to talk about would be what's called the odd number of electrons. So having an odd number, and specifically nitrogen can have an odd number of electrons around it, all right? Some, and not always, and same thing here, like these don't always have to break the um, octet rule. Sometimes they will obey, obey it, sometimes they won't. These always break the octet rule. You may want to make that distinction in your notes too when you're trying to memorize these exceptions. These always break the octet rule. Sometimes these will. Sometimes nitrogen can have an odd number of electrons around it. We'll talk about more what this means when we do our Lewis structures. Um, but for now, just know that sometimes you can have one random odd electron sitting on top of nitrogen if it has to. He's really the only guy that can. Alright, so those are all exceptions to the octet rule that you should keep in the back of your mind when you're doing Lewis structures and geometries and things like that, and you're drawing your molecules. Sometimes you may be forced to break the octet rule, and that's okay. That's okay. Most of the time, your elements will obey that octet rule, like carbon will always obey the octet rule. Don't ever make him break it. He loves the octet rule. He's a big fan. Oxygen's another big fan of the octet rule. All right, we always really try and strive for that. Um, all right, the last thing about bonding that I want to talk about um, are multiple bonds. And these are going to be covalent bonds. This happens during covalent bonding. Um, but multiple bonds. So we have single bonds, we have double bonds, and we have triple bonds. We do not have quadruple bonds. No such thing. You can't have a home run. You can have single, double, or triple. Single bonds are shown with just a single dash between the two atoms. A double bond has two dashes, kind of looks like an equal sign. And a triple bond has three dashes. I realize that came as a big shock to you. <laughs> Big surprise, three dashes. All right, so that's how we show a single, double, or triple bond. I also 
want you guys to understand how many electrons are involved in these types of bonds. All right, so in a single bond, you have two electrons, usually one from each atom. So atom X contributes one electron, atom Y contributes one electron. And that makes the two electrons in the single bond. Because of this, all right, so when we show that, if we're counting up atoms around our, um, we're counting up electrons around our atom, we say that this single bond contributes two electrons over here and two electrons over here. We can distribute them like that because they're shared electrons. All right? That's why this works with covalent bonding, because sometimes we're around X, sometimes we're around Y. From the individual atom's point of view, he's looking around saying, oh, two electrons from the single bond, I'm happy. <clears throat> the other atom is saying, oh, two electrons from the single bond, that's great. Okay? A double bond consists of four electrons. So when we write that out, X looks at these and says, oh, I have four electrons from that. And Y says, oh, I also have four electrons from that, even though there's only four electrons shared between them. Because it's shared, those four electrons spend time around each atom. And then a triple bond is made up of six electrons. So again, each of those is going to see six electrons from that triple bond in this valence shell. So going back over here to my hydrogen, beryllium, and boron, hydrogen is only able to make a single bond. He can donate one electron, his only electron, into a single bond, and somebody else is going to have to donate another one in order for him to be satisfied with two electrons. That's all he can hold, because he only has a 1s orbital, doesn't he? All right, and the most you can put into that first crystal energy level was two electrons. So that's why he can only make a single bond. Beryllium, he'll have four electrons around him, two from this single bond, two from that single bond. Boron will only have six electrons, two and two and two. All right, he's not going to make any triple bonds. All right, he'll make three single bonds, and that's all he can handle. I don't want you to get too hung up on the exact structures and why and orbitals and all that stuff, but for now, you don't need to know that. But I do want you to know those exceptions and how many bonds it'll make, how many electrons are in each type of bond, okay? Because when you start drawing Lewis structures, you'll need to understand how to count your electrons. Did you say Brian won't make a triple bond? It'll just take three single bonds. But it'll still have six electrons, but they'll come from three single bonds. Questions? Okay, all of this is leading up to drawing Lewis structures. We're going to maybe start talking a little bit about Lewis structures and then we'll finish talking about them on um, Wednesday. Now, next week in lab, you have lab number 434. And that is all about drawing molecules and little structures and all that jazz. It's probably a good idea to do that worksheet in you know, lab 434 for two reasons. One, you get to do it for lab anyways. <laughs> so that's a good reason. Two, it's a completion grade. Well, that's an easy 20 out of 20 for your lab grade. And three, it'll just give you some good ideas and practice and see how things are broken down when drawing Lewis structures. It'll help you study for this fourth exam. That being said, in all honesty, I can't get too excited about Lab 434. I think they made it way more complicated than it needed to be. That's probably not too surprising now that we finished all those labs this semester and they were like, making it crazy complicated and not explaining and half the time they weren't using English. I understand that. I, I, I'm with you. I've, I've had a lot of complaints. Um, but it is decent practice. You'll get, you will get something from it if you can just do it. All right. Um, so make sure that you do that next week for lab, lab 434. All right, so drawing Lewis structures. 
A Lewis structure is going to be a two-dimensional picture of the molecule. Now what we did before was just kind of a simple dot formulas where you have like this. Um, like we talked about sodium has one valence electron and so we just use a one valence electron on sodium. That was that looks fine. Now when we're going to be combining atoms together to make molecules, we're going to do these Lewis dot structures. So the first thing you need to do is have the formula for your molecule. So let's just take um, just the carbon tetrachloride. We'll do this together and we'll just kind of go through this procedure and then we'll stop for today and we'll pick up on Wednesday. So the first thing you need to do is have the formula. The reason why this is very helpful to you is so that you can count your atoms and make sure you've got everybody accounted for. Step one of writing a Lewis structure is to add up the number of valence electrons that you have to work with. Each atom is going to contribute a certain number of valence electrons to the pool. It's kind of like when everybody in the office pitches in some money to buy a gift for the boss. All right, so somebody might put in two bucks, somebody might put in five, somebody might put in ten, but everybody's contributing money to the pool of money. And then one person takes all that money and goes and buys um, the gift. Okay? Sorry, I don't need to mention that right now. So that's what we're doing. Each, L, each atom is contributing a certain number of valence electrons. So carbon, I have one carbon atom. Carbon is con going to contribute how many valence electrons? What four. group number is it? It's in group four. So carbon has four valence electrons. Why am I only looking at valence electrons? Because those are the ones that matter. Because those are the ones that bond. Yeah. yeah. You never bond with your core electrons. You bond on the valence electrons, the ones that are on the outer shell. Carbon has two S electrons, two P electrons. That's four valence electrons. We look at the group number, and that tells you how many valence electrons you've got. At least for the 18 group elements. Now, I have four chlorine atoms. Each chlorine atom will contribute seven. seven. So I have four times seven. I add all that up and that gives me 32 electrons. That's step one, add up the number of valence electrons. Step two, you need to draw a skeleton structure. In order to do that, you need to decide your central atom. Your central atom is just what it sounds like. It's going to be the atom that's in the middle of the molecule and everything else goes around it. How do you decide your central atom? Well, there are certain criteria that need to be followed. Number one, it is usually, but not always, usually the least electronegative element that's going to be your central atom. The reason why it's your least electronegative element is because it's going to be full of bonds and it's going to be sharing electrons. Your more electronegative elements don't like to bond. They're selfish. Remember, they're pulling the electrons towards it. They don't want to share the toys. So more electronegative elements are going to be around the peripheral of your um, molecule because they want to have extra electrons around them. So that's one criteria, least electronegative element. Another one is um, if you only have one of it, whatever you have the least of, is oftentimes going to be your central atom. A third criterion, if you have hydrogen, it will never be a central atom, ever, under any circumstances. If you ever have hydrogen as a central atom, I don't care if it's your least electronegative element and you only have one of it, not your central atom, okay? Another criterion is if you have carbons, Carbons love to be the central atom. They're more than happy to be the central atom, even if they're not the least electronegative element. Even if you have more than one. You can't have more than one central atom. It's possible. It depends on your molecule. So in this case, I am sure you can figure out what your central atom will be. It's going to be the carbon. So we're going to put the carbon here in the center, and then you're going to kind of draw the rest of your atoms around it. And you try to make it symmetrical if you can. All right, things kind of spread out evenly. We're not worried about molecule shape right now. We're just doing 2D structures. 
So I'm just going to spread my four carbon, or my four chlorines around the carbon like that. That's my skeleton structure. At this point, we've collected all the money, and we're going to go to the store, and we're going to start buying the gifts. Now, when you're spending your valence electrons, there's some rules. Yeah, there's so many rules in life, right? Life sucks. All right, here are the rules for spending your valence electrons. Number one, you can buy bonds or you can buy lone pairs. Remember we talked about lone pairs, those are the non-bonded electrons that come in pairs of two. So it's kind of like you can buy actual gifts for the bonds or you can buy gift cards. All right, those are sort of your two options. So you have to buy bonds or lone pairs the different bonds cost different amounts of money. So a single bond is going to cost you two electrons. A double bond will cost you four electrons. A triple bond is going to cost you six electrons. That's what we just talked about a minute ago. So keep in mind those prices, if you will, when you're spending your electrons. You can only spend the number of electrons that you've got. All right, so when you go to the store to buy that gift for your boss, you only have the $32 that you collected from the colleagues. All right, so we can only spend 32 electrons. So the first thing you need to do is make sure everything is somehow bound together. You want to start drawing single bonds from your central atom to everything else because everything has to somehow be connected. Otherwise, it's not part of the molecule. So when I put in those four single bonds, I spent two, four, six, eight electrons. So I'm going to subtract eight electrons. You gotta keep a running total to how much money you spent, right? You don't like budgeting. You cannot overspend your budget, people. That's what America really has to learn. You cannot overspend your budget. <laughs> you have $32, and that's all. All right, so when we subtract out our eight electrons, how much money do we have left? 36. Right? No, 24. 24. 24 electrons. All right, we have 24 electrons left to spend. Now, I can spend them using bonds or lone pairs, all right? Let's take a look at this now. Once you've completed those initial bonds, you're gonna start needing to look at octet rules. Who's obeyed the octet rule? Who has not obeyed the octet rule? How many more electrons do you need? How electronegative are they? Are you gonna to wanna to put lone pairs around the more electronegative elements? Or do you want to put in multiple bonds? I don't know. Each molecule is different. We're gonna. You can follow this same general pattern for all molecules, but you may have to be flexible. All right, so let's take a look at this. When we're looking at octet rule, at this point, carbon is satisfied. He has two, four, six, eight electrons that he sees in his little world, and he's happy. You cannot put lone pairs on carbon, and you're not going to want to put any multiple bonds because then he's going to have more than eight. When you're drawing Lewis structures, a lot of people find it helpful to draw a little check next to the individual atoms that have been satisfied. It helps you just keep track of it. Like, okay, I can't do anything else around carbon because he's good to go. So now I have 24 electrons that I need to spend, but I can't put any more bonds. So that means I need to spend $24 in gift cards. Okay? Gift cards are going to be our loan pairs. I can put 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24 electrons. If I spend all 24 electrons, am I satisfying the octet rule for everybody else? Each of these chlorines has three lone pairs and a bond. They are each satisfied. That octet rule is obeyed with chlorine. Yes, you have lone pairs, non-bonded electrons. That's okay. Chlorine is very electronegative. He likes lone pairs around him. Ninety-nine percent of the time, your halogens will always look like this. They'll have a single bond and three lone pairs. Ninety-nine percent of the time, they very rarely will want to make multiple bonds because they would really want to share. Like those electrons, right? Okay, they're very close to being isoelectronic with a noble gas. They just want to share with that one extra electron in a single bond, and then they're happy. Okay? So that's how you're going to essentially follow through this pattern of, of writing your Lewis structures. Figure out how many valence electrons you have. Um, start obeying the octet rule by adding single bonds. You've got to connect them somehow, right, to the central atom. And then start looking at who's obeyed the octet rule 
who hasn't, who needs exceptions to the octet rule or not, all right? And then start spending either multiple bonds or loan pairs as necessary. Every molecule is different. Attack it like a fresh beast, but you can follow the same general format. And towards the end, sometimes you just have to massage it a little bit, okay? And then sometimes, sometimes you're just like, well, we'll just go to the third electron right there. Good to go. Every molecule is different, okay? It's just the way it is. All right, this is a very simple, straightforward example. We will pick up next time with this um, and work some more examples together so you can see how to do it and when to do it in multiple bonds or not.